Warning, this episode is going full speed ahead into spoiler territory for the Magnus Archives. I'm talking about spoiling basically everything in the show here, so if you have any intention of listening to it, which you should if you haven't already, bookmark this page and book it out of here so you can enjoy the series in its true glory. Also, this episode is going to feature in-depth discussions of fear, in particular as they relate to climate change, radiation, technology, and the end of the world as we know it. As a result, viewer discretion is advised. Oh, and a massive thank you to the Magnus Archives wiki, which was very useful in getting the info for this video together. Hey y'all, I'm Afton G. here, and welcome back to what I thought would be the shortest episode of Entities Explained, the series where I break down the 15 entities from the hit horror anthology podcast, The Magnus Archives. For our semi-final episode, we'll be covering an entity that might not even be fully formed by the time Mag 200 rolls around. But if you want to hear about the entities this series actually focused on, I'd suggest checking out the playlist in the top right corner of your screen those might be a better place to start than this one. Anyways, subscribe or be consumed by the very technology you helped to create and prepare yourselves for the extinction. Also known as the terrible change, the future without us, or the world is always ending, the extinction isn't actually a part of Robert Smirk's list of 14 fears. Rather, the extinction was a power that seemed to be in a state of emergence by the end of the series, having only really been categorized by Adelard Decker in 2006, though it could potentially have been emerging as soon in the timeline as the early 1800s. The extinction represents the fear of catastrophe on a global scale, but it might be more accurate to describe the extinction as the fear of change. As the name The Future Without Us might suggest, the extinction feeds on anxieties of human extinction, and the worry of what may grow to replace us. Those replacements could be the trash we left behind, or the technology that we created, which are clearly both very homocentric. It also tends to emerge in the destruction or perversion of nature, which makes sense for a symbol of human progress eventually consuming itself. Then, of course, there's the apocalyptic events, such as man-made weapons or climate changes, which appear all throughout the extinction's manifestations. We'll really dig into what makes the extinction different from other powers in the analysis, so for now, that's where I'll leave it. The terrible change has an absurdly small amount of appearances, some of which may not even have to do with the extinction. So instead of doing this episode as I normally would by talking about the characters, artifacts, locations, and more individually, I'll just talk about the episodes associated with the extinction, both the explicit and the likely. Don't worry, this shouldn't take too long. Mag 134, Time of Revelation, is one of the best examples of an extinction episode, which is interesting because it's also the episode where Decker lays out his full theory on how this new entity would work. Adelard Decker recounts in One Letter to Gertrude the story of Bernadette Delcor, who was an expert in failed apocalypse predictions. Bernadette went into an apartment in France, once belonging to notable ex-Millerite and predictor of a future without humanity, Garland Hillier. Hillier had never been confirmed dead, and very little was known about his life after his final paper, L'Avenir, so, when the door to his apartment was uncovered, Delcour decided to make her way down there and check it out. Unfortunately for her, the apartment turned out to be more than just a time capsule, as when Delcour stepped out of the apartment, she found herself in a timeless world filled with ashen, standing, hundred-year-old mummies. In this dead world, something moved, though whether it was the corpses themselves or some other inheritor is not made clear. Regardless, Delcour eventually found her way back to the apartment and exited through the door to find the world exactly as it had been when she left. Decker imagines that the extinction will eventually come once again for Delcour, and that she may not be able to find her way back a second time. The next definitive extinction-related statement we get is Mag 144 Decrypted, which tells the story of Gary Boylan. Boylan moved back to his childhood home in the countryside following the death of his mother, and would often go out for walks to get some time away from his callous father. On one such walk, Boylan's iPod cut out, only to have his music replaced with an odd track called Numbers. 
At first, it seemed to be silent, but as Boylan continued his walk, the station began playing the start of the Skyboat song before cutting to the distorted voice of a man reading off numbers. The track was not in his library and certainly wasn't from a radio station, but seemed at least to have a passing resemblance to the infamous number stations across the globe. The numbers also seemed to give Boylan an impending sense of doom, which left him shaken even after his music returned. Boylan, curious about the track, began researching number stations and looking for the track on his walks, which he eventually traced to an old pylon, which should in no way have been capable of broadcasting a signal. Boylan spent the next few hours writing down and checking the sequence, which he then confirmed was unchanging with several further visits. Boylan fell to madness, trying to crack the numbers, eventually concluding that they foretold the fall of all mankind. He went to visit the pylon again, the number is now clear even without headphones, but it did not relent, and the episode ends with Gary Boylan returning to his home to find it in ruin, his father no more than a blast shadow on the wall. Interestingly, both of the songs in this episode have military connections, and the sequence of numbers we get can be decoded into the world is always ending using a Polybius square. Not particularly helpful, just kind of neat. Mag 149 Concrete Jungle is up next, which tells of Judith O'Neill, Fernanda Mikado, and Dr. Nikos Anastos, who went on an ill-fated trip into the Amazon on a particularly rainy day. The downpour eventually got them turned around, and the crew found themselves in a strange parody of a Yanomami Shabono, constructed of discarded plastic, metal, and concrete rather than the thatch and log normally used in the structures. The interior of the Shibono was filled with immobile humanoid figures, constructed from assorted trash along with a curious concrete pit viper, which Dr. Anastos foolishly picked up. The snake unsurprisingly came to life and bit the unsuspecting doctor, causing liquid concrete to come pouring out of his body. The other figures also began to move, which was enough of a hint for the other two to start running, eventually being rescued by the true Yanomami and led back to safety. In Mag 156 Reflection, we hear another letter from Decker to Gertrude Robinson, this time telling the story of an anonymous party planner who was scoping out an abandoned carnival as a potential site for what Decker apparently incorrectly described as a rave. Our statement giver was exploring a hall of mirrors when he was, by some process he would rather not describe, dragged through a funhouse mirror that reflected him as a tall, thin figure. On the other side, the unfortunate host found a still operational carnival filled with starving, gaunt figures. Their gnawing hunger was put into effect when one of the gangly visitors was thrown from an attraction, being injured quite badly in the process, only to be devoured by the other park goers. It was at this point that our statement giver decided that he had seen enough, and ran back to the Hall of Mirrors, the starving masses hot on his heels. After diving through an empty mirror, the man found his way back home, though he apparently still catches glimpses of a thin figure every now and then, which Decker suspects will soon return to claim him. The last episode that's definitely related to the extinction is Mag 175, Epoch. One of the many domains John and Martin encounter on their post-change walk through hell is a bit more traditionally post-apocalyptic, being the only confirmed manifestation of the extinction in the entire series. Leah is a person trapped in this rotting world, and she's trying to actively catalog the horrors of the wasteland. She describes a lamp that persistently glows despite having no power, evolutionary mockeries of seagulls with no sea to call home, a history book rendered useless by water damage and age, an impressively useless umbrella, a native creature to the devastated landscape, and finally, a set of bones that may once have been her own. This one is uh, definitely something. Now that we've covered all the statements that were very likely to be connected to the extinction, let's talk about some of the possible extinction statements, starting with Mag 5 thrown away. Kieran Woodward is a trash man who found several bags of odd garbage outside of 93 Lancaster Road. The first bag was filled with doll heads, the next had strips of paper with the Lord's Prayer on it, 
The next was filled with teeth, and so on. Eventually, Woodward's co-worker, Alan Parfit, began obsessing over the house, spending many nights watching it until his disappearance. When Woodward arrived at the scene, all he found was a trash bag filled with packing peanuts and a bronze heart, engraved with the name Alan Parfit. While this episode definitely has a lot of connections to the flesh, given its similarity to Tom Hahn's ability to duplicate the religious theming and the confirmation by the show's creator that this was their intention, many people have proposed that the garbage bags outside of 93 are actually a manifestation of the extinction, being symbolic of the many items thrown away by people. Given that there's precedent for garbage representing the extinction, I think this is a very fair interpretation. Mag 65 Binary is another episode that is commonly attributed to the extinction despite the authors having confirmed that it was in fact meant to be a spiral episode. According to Tessa Winters, a computer scientist, she accidentally encountered a true manifestation of an ancient chatbot urban legend, Sergei Yushanka. Yushanka had supposedly transferred his consciousness into a computer to escape a degenerative brain disease, only to discover that a digital mind isn't all it's cracked up to be. Tessa had seen plenty of normal Yushanka bots in the past, but this one called Yushanka's Despair.exe refused to shut down. When she tried, it only showed a video of a man, presumably Yushanka, meticulously eating his keyboard, one keycap at a time. No matter how Tessa tried to escape, the video would follow her to the nearest screen, continuing as Yushanka moved from the keyboard to the glass of the screen. In the end, the only solution she could come up with was sitting and watching the whole video, which totaled in at a maddening 17 hours of computer consumption. After that, though, it apparently never came back. This one I could definitely see as an early extinction manifestation, since this is basically just the dark side of the transhumanist idea, and an exploration of the very real possibility that flesh and machine can never perfectly be combined. It's a horrific glance at a possible future for technology, which sounds an awful lot like the future without us. One which I've heard a bit of community discourse around that I don't really get is Mag84, Possessive. This feels at least to me like a very open and shut corruption episode, but I suppose I should give the summary before my judgments. Adrian Weiss spent some time living in Cratfield as a child, where he became friends with a quiet boy named Gordon Goodman, who would deliver groceries to the old recluse living in the town dump, Margaret Carnegie. Weiss would sometimes go on the deliveries with Goodman, but he paid careful attention to never get too close to the house, at least until Goodman disappeared. Weiss eventually mustered up the courage to go into the dump to find him, only to see old Maggie creating paper mache masks with Goodman's face. The next day at school, Goodman seemed perfectly fine, and Weiss left town about a year later, only returning once to learn that the old heap had been renamed from Maggie's dump to Gordy's dump. This episode has a lot of Weird, gross, corruption nonsense, but I suppose it does deal with trash and human remains, and could possibly, depending on how you interpret Maggie's action, involve people being replaced with trash. I'm really not sure about this one, I'll be honest, but it turns up a surprising amount, so I had to mention it. This is another one I just don't get, but the wiki page for the extinction lists a possible manifestation as Mag 114 Cracked Foundation so I might as well cover it. 114 is the setup for the rift in realities used by the web to escape a dying world, and it tells the story of Anya Vallette, a cleaner from what we can presume is another world, perhaps the world of protocol that we can't be sure until the series releases, who went down into the basement of student housing on Hilltop Road, only to emerge in a reality that was not her own. Her friends don't recognize her, some locations seem different, and most importantly, she has never heard of the Magnus Institute. I suppose you could argue that this episode deals with alternate realities and slightly different timelines, which does have some weird futurism implications, but I'd argue this episode is web, and if not, then it belongs to no entity, since Valette likely comes from a world where the things that were fear never existed. I really don't understand this one. If anyone wants to explain it in the comments, be my guest. 
The last episode that isn't expressly connected to the extinction, but certainly feels extinction adjacent, is Mag 122, Zombie, and I certainly support this one. Laurel St. John, who doesn't feel much empathy for others, finds herself beginning to wonder if everyone is quite so real as they might first seem. St. John begins to suspect that her roommate is a philosophical zombie, or an empty husk that behaves like a human, but isn't, and as time goes on, she starts to spot more and more of them around until eventually she believes that there are no real people left besides herself. This one definitely has a lot of stuff going on, but the idea that the world is changing in some terrible way is almost by definition what the extinction does, and the poor imitations of people St. John encounters seem an awful lot like something that might inherit the Earth. Hell, it would be fitting of TMA's take on zombies to be the work of an apocalyptic power, since that's the fiction genre they are most often occupying. The only thing that would make this feel less like an Extinction episode is how similar it is to other episodes that didn't quite make the cut. Mag 48, Lost in the Crowd, Mag 108, Monologue, and Mag 150, Cul-de-Sac are all likely lonely statements that contain similar themes of empty worlds, and specifically referring to the first two, crowds of things that aren't quite human. So in conclusion, Mag 122 could go to the Extinction, or it could be Lonely, Spiral, Stranger, or even something else. Who knows? Something else that I think is worth mentioning is the disproven emergences of the extinction that Decker investigated and concluded were actually the doing of some other force. Mag 133 Breathing Room, for example, recounts how Decker started investigating several mysterious carbon monoxide poisonings where no carbon monoxide was present. While Decker originally suspected that it might have something to do with the extinction, it turned out to just be the work of the end through a new avatar, Justin Go, who would poison others through his dreams. Still, Decker chose not to step in, stalking Go out to the home of a potential future victim, waiting until he fell asleep, and then lobotomizing him with a meat skewer, leaving him temporarily powerless. Obviously, this one wound up being the work of the end, but I'm curious what exactly Decker thought would be extinction related here. Most carbon monoxide deaths are related to human activity, and I suppose you could make some climate connection if you really wanted to, but it feels like shaky ground. One that seemed a bit more reasonable to expect out of the extinction though is Mag 157 Rotten Core, which featured the final journey of Adelard Decker. Klonksbull, a small German town, had apparently been overtaken by an inexplicable and grotesque disease, which Decker suspected may have been a pandemic manifestation of the extinction. So, like a reasonable individual, he snuck into a highly infected town, only to find firsthand just how disturbing the effects of the disease were. Not only did it cause flesh to liquefy and skin to fall away, but it also didn't kill the people it affected, which is somehow worse. Decker eventually tracked the illness back to John Amherst, a notable corruption avatar, who he paralyzed and buried in concrete, only to find that he had become infected in the struggle. As a final act of mercy to himself and the whole town, Decker torched all of the remaining bodies, leaving the world in an unflinchingly epic way. Aside from being an incredible episode, I think this one is worth mentioning because it made me realize just how much overlap there is between the extinction and the corruption. It might just be that the things we associate with apocalypse, and thus, that would be associated with the terrible change, are things that we find disgusting. Diseases, refuse, insects all find their way into extinction statements, and several of the statements on the fence of the world is always ending deal with those same topics. It was a connection I've never really thought about, but this episode has certainly opened my eyes. As a bridge between the statements and the analysis, let's talk a bit about the potential emergence of the extinction, and the actions taken to prevent it. While the extinction's emergence may have been on the horizon for a little under 200 years, most of the preventative measures we know of hadn't been taken until the mid-aughts, when Decker identified it. 
Decker, while obviously concerned about the extinction, spent more of his time researching its emergence and trying to prove its existence than actually stopping it, so I'm not going to count him among the active efforts. Peter Lucas, on the other hand, definitely had plans to try and stop the extinction, and he almost went through with them. Peter planned to stop the extinction from manifesting by using the power of the Millbank Prison Panopticon to learn everything he could about the extinction. Unfortunately, though, he couldn't do it by himself, which is where Martin Blackwood came in. Following the hospitalization of the archivist and the arrest of Elias Bouchard, Peter stepped in as the head of the institute and took a distraught Martin in as his assistant. By isolating Martin, Peter could create exactly what he needed to stop the extinction. Someone who followed the lonely but still had a connection to the eye and thus the panopticon. Unfortunately for Peter, though, his months of conditioning weren't enough, and Martin refused to supplant Jonah Magnus as the Panopticon's user, which brought an end to Peter's anti-extinction scheme. Simon Fairchild was another Avatar who didn't want the extinction to manifest, but for him the concern was a bit less severe, so he seemingly just hitched his wagon on Peter's plan. Elias Bouchard was the only other Avatar we ever saw considering the emergence, but his plan revolved around beating it to the finish line rather than just stopping it. Through the gradual building up of the Archivist, Elias intended to go through with a mass ritual, tentatively named the Magnus Archives, before the extinction could ever fully manifest. While we never got to see what the extinction's manifestation would look like, we did get to hear a few theories, some of which sounded just as apocalyptic as the power itself. Lucas, for example, theorized that the extinction would actually be the end of humanity, instead of replacing us with something else that could learn to fear it. In the end, though, the change came before the extinction could ever emerge, so we're left to hope for answers in the Magnus Protocol. I think that finally brings us to the analysis, a full 6 pages and 22 minutes into what was supposed to be a short script. Oh my god. Anyways, since I'm obligated to do so at this point, let's talk about what the extinction could symbolize from a storytelling standpoint. This is gonna sound really meta, but I think the extinction could be said to symbolize unfinished or abandoned storylines and plot points, and not just because I think the extinction feels abandoned. First of all, from a lore standpoint, the extinction never actually gets to manifest. It's an idea, something people are worried about, but it never got to exist on the same level as Smirks 14, which is very similar to the way ideas work. As anyone who's ever done anything creative can tell you, there are an uncountable amount of ideas that never make it to the final product. Things that have to be changed partway through production, or ideas that are no longer compatible with the story you want to tell. There's a reason Faulkner's famous quote, Kill Your Darlings, continues on as writing advice into the modern day. The course of a narrative is not set, and TMA is ironically a great example of this. There were apparently a lot of ideas for the ending that never came into being, but even smaller details like Martin being aligned with the lonely instead of the web, or Sasha having to be replaced early on, were not a part of the original plan. Change, which happens to be the very thing the extinction relies on, is an essential part of storytelling. If y'all have a better idea, as always, feel free to share them in the comments below, but I'm pretty happy with this one. Now that that's out of the way, we can actually talk about the extinction. As I just alluded to and have outright said multiple times, I don't think the extinction ever got the conclusion it really deserved. Season 4, at least in Martin's subplot, was all about the extinction, but in Season 5 it was mostly forgotten, relegated to a one-off domain which answered no questions and arguably only served to make the absence more noticeable. The terrible change feels unfinished, which might be the point since it never really manifested, but it doesn't make for particularly satisfying storytelling. And I think that's a tragedy because the extinction had the potential to be one of the most interesting fears out of the 15. The extinction, even more than the flesh, is distinctly man-made, a fear which never would have existed without the digital age, and that's fascinating. Humanity is, now more than ever in its history, capable of utterly destroying itself, and several branches of science could allow for the creation of unnatural horrors to take our place. It really is the perfect fear for our modern world, and it's a shame we never got to see much out of it. 
Also worth mentioning is how cool it is that the extinction isn't just about the end of all things, but about death, rebirth, and change, because that's what most apocalypse stories are about. In fact, etymologically, the world apocalypse itself just means an unveiling or revelation, not, as you might expect, an ending. The other really interesting angle you could take with the extinction is how it sort of breaks the idea of the entities altogether. I have been meaning for a long time now to do a video about the classifications of the fears and how the change doesn't quite prove Smirk's theories as much as it seems to. But the extinction is interesting because we can see firsthand just how arbitrary the classifications are. Decker, the leading researcher of the extinction, believed that a well-documented corruption avatar was actually aligned with the extinction, even if indirectly. The fringe episodes like Mag 65 Binary or Mag 122 Zombie could be easily explained with existing powers, and the episodes that feel more solidly extinction can still be reasoned away if you squint and tilt your head. The extinction proves that smaller powers can exist, and that the edges between entities are a lot blurrier than they often seem. Again, obviously this is a big topic and it will someday get its own video, but I think the extinction is proof that Smirks 14 or any system of organization is inherently flawed, which I now realize is ironic coming from someone who's spent the past year organizing. Finally, I want to talk about how weird it is that there's only one snake in the Magnus Archives, and it's in an extinction episode. Obviously, in 200 episodes, they can't get to every fear, but ophidiophobia, or the fear of snakes, is one of the most common. In my quick research, I saw a lot of conflicting numbers, but it seems that 10% of adults and 20% of teenagers have a fear of snakes. For reference, the fear of spiders affects somewhere between 3 and 5% of people. Yeah. Despite this untapped well of fear potential, the only snake that ever appears in TMA is a concrete pit viper that fills a man with liquid screed. Weirdly, there's a lot of precedent for a snake to be associated with the apocalypse, which is a real sentence that I just said. Mythologically, there are a number of serpents found in the end of the world. One of the most famous is Jormungandr, a giant snake in Norse mythology which encircles the globe biting its own tail. If that description of a snake biting its own tail sounds familiar, you might be thinking of the common alchemical symbol, the Ouroboros, used to represent the cycle of death and rebirth, which sounds an awful lot like the extinction's MO to me. Anyways, back to the world serpent, Jormungandr was predicted to one day release its tail, and on that day, Ragnarok will begin. Moving south, we find Apophis, also called Apep in ancient Egyptian mythology. Apophis was a giant serpent representative of darkness and opponent to the sun god Ra, that exists as part of the underworld. Ra's cycle of death and rebirth, wow, almost like this is a running theme, would involve his movement as the sun across the sky before eventually sinking below the horizon to do battle with Apophis. Apophis would attack the sun god's holy barge in an effort to prevent the sun from rising again the next morning, but he would always be fended off by a number of gods and righteous dead, along with help from some rituals by living Egyptians. The Mapuche people of Chile and Argentina had a flood myth involving two serpents, named Trentren Vilu and Kai Kai Vilu, who reshaped the geography of the region. The two snakes were the transformed children of powerful Pilan, which for now I'll just explain as spirits because otherwise this video would get long fast. Mapuche mythology is really cool and I suggest y'all look into it if you ever have time. And were made to live in different parts of the world, with Kai Kai living in the ocean and Tren Tren living on the land. The two were rivals, and when Tren Tren saw the ungratefulness of mankind, he tried to flood them out of existence as punishment. Kai Kai, having none of this, lifted the remaining humans into the mountains where the floodwaters could not get them, and transformed those already overcome by the deluge into all sorts of animals, fantastical creatures, and statues. Thanks to this battle of rising hills and water levels, Chile was given its unique geography, and the two snakes remain, manifesting as floodwaters and erupting volcanoes. If that doesn't obviously carry the theme of change, I don't know what I could do to convince you. 
Finally, I obviously have to talk about the role of the biblical serpent in the Eden story. For those of you who don't know, in the Abrahamic faiths, the Garden of Eden was a paradise where everything was perfect for humanity, until the serpent convinced the two original humans, named Adam and Eve, to eat a fruit that would get them booted out of heaven. The serpent and the fruit, often stylized as an apple, are common symbols in Western media, and the role of the serpent as an agent of temptation and change feels an awful lot like it would fit the themes of the extinction. Oh, I didn't expect this to take so long, but now I can officially say we are done with the extinction. There is just one episode left for us to cover, and that's crazy to think about. I've got a lot of other projects in the work, including that malevolent video I promise is coming soon, and a major Magnus video before Protocol's release, so the close of this series, much like The Extinction, is just a change, not an ending. As always, if I missed anything, please let me know in the comments, along with letting me know if you have any theories of your own, if you disagree with my takes, or if you just want to say hi. Now that we're down to just the one... I'm sure you can all guess what's next, but a hint is in order. So get ready to come face to face with Terminus in next month's episode. Oh, and before I forget, you should subscribe to the channel. We just recently passed 1.5k, and while I probably won't make it to 2k by the end of the year, that shouldn't stop us from trying. Thank you once again for watching the video. I've been Afton G. Kier, and this has been Entities Explained. Good night, YouTube people.